I want to talk a little bit about history can be a shortcut to finding an authentic voice in design, specifically in my practice of typeface design, since that's what I'm really qualified to talk about. Um, so, and I obviously I work in a rather specialized field, but um, I know we have a broad range of people here from different disciplines. Um, hopefully something that I talk about will resonate with you. Um, first to tell you a little more about myself. Um, as Dan mentioned, I co-founded a type foundry called XYZ Type uh, with my partner, Ben Keel. It's just the two of us, we're a small business and we sell our typefaces, our fonts through this website, xyz.com. Uh, we launched a year ago and um, we have a few more typefaces coming out soon, one of which you'll see today. Um, the other side of my business, aside from retail fonts, developing and selling retail fonts, is doing custom lettering and typefaces for branding. Uh, I've worked with a variety of clients, but uh, one of my favorite clients is a design agency called Original Champions of Design, or OCD for short. Um, I've done a, a few projects with them in the past. I did custom lettering for the Museum for African Art and St. Bart's Church, uh, both in Manhattan. Uh, we also, th so those were like designing the logotype lettering, just for those few letters. But then I also designed a full functional typeface for Museum for African Art, which you can see on the top right there. Um, so I, I think OCD sort of specializes in diving deep into an organization's history and culture as the basis for the design system. Um, and using that history as a shortcut to authenticity, which is sort of the theme of what I'm talking about. Um, most recently, I worked with them on the design system for Dartmouth College, which is what I'll be using as an example to talk about that basic principle. Uh, Bobby, at, Bobby Martin at OCD had brought, brought me in to help establish Dartmouth's new typographic palette. Uh, this is their, basically their existing design system was this shield with this logo, I guess, their name typed out in the typeface Bembo, somewhat an arbitrary choice. Um, the typography used with it was inconsistent. They're using a bunch of different typefaces. They had this shield, which has evolved over time, but still held in this um, somewhat offensive, sort of racist imperialist depiction of American Indians. A lot of people had issues with that. Um, also, just in a very pragmatic sense, none of their assets really scaled down well for social media. They had nothing they could use for a Twitter avatar, that sort of thing. Um, so that sort of um, was the beginning of the project, but uh, Bobby sat me down and talked me through all of this, what the problem was, and said that they wanted to tap into the history of the institution. And this whole time I was basically sitting on my hands, eagerly waiting to say, oh my gosh, there's this guy, Rudolf Rizika, who's like my favorite typeface designer. Uh, he did a bunch of projects for Dartmouth College over the years. Uh, and in 1968, Dartmouth College Library published this book called Studies in Type Design. Um, uh, studies in Type Design is a portfolio of concepts, and it's going ahead, sorry, portfolio of concepts for typefaces by Ruzika, uh, which I first encountered back when I was an undergrad at RISD in the school library there, uh, just randomly on the bookshelf. But that's how I became aware of Rudolf Ruzika and of this, this book. Uh, and actually that book was one of my earliest um, inspirations for becoming a typeface designer and really um, gave me a lot of ideas about the breadth of expression that could happen in a typeface. These were essentially proposals for typeface by, typefaces by Ruzika, uh, which he created as hand-painted broadside specimens. Uh, but they were never made into fonts. They were not made in metal or in phototype setting or in digital form. All of these technologies happened over the years since he originally published them in 1968. Um, Ruzika had only released two typefaces in his lifetime, Fairfield and Primer, both for hot metal type setting on the linotype machine. Uh, but here are a number of additional typeface concepts that never were realized, never completed. And for years I had been drawn to this idea of resurrecting them and making them into digital fonts for the first time. Uh, Ruzika died in 1978, a year before I was born. And these alphabets basically stayed locked up inside a book since then. So talking to Bobby and his team, I proposed that we used Ruzika's, uh, Ruzika's typeface ideas for Dartmouth as the basis for their typographic system. And Bobby was really excited about this idea. Totally a coincidence that he brought me in. He didn't know about this connection at all. So that was just a great, uh, great circumstance there. Uh, but we were particularly drawn to this one alphabet from the studies in type design and decided to use it as the basis for the primary typeface family in their design system. 
Uh, what we liked about this design particularly is how it kind of walks this tightrope between calligraphic and typographic style. Uh, it has an angular quality, but it's still rather gentle and conservative, you could say. Um, it's rustic in a way, but not, but also sort of academic, which I think is the uh, sort of zeitgeist of Dartmouth College as an institution as well. Um, it has a strong sense of history and harkens back to Rudolf Rzika's roots uh, growing up in, the Czech, uh, in Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic. Um, but it still has a, a freshness that feels relevant today. And it just so happened that over the years when I had, um, since I had seen this book many years ago, almost 10 years ago, I started digitizing this very alphabet, the one from this first plate of the 10 in this book. And uh, it was the one that I was most excited about, also happened to be the one that Bobby was as well. Um, I started this years ago, had kind of put the project on hold because I was never quite happy with the interpretation that I had made. Uh, so it was great serendipity that OCD came to me. Having a client gave me the motivation to finish this project and focus my decision making in the process. Um, I'm all about the research. OCD is all about the research as well. And since Ruzika died before I was born, there was no way for me to communicate with him directly. But um, I researched him in depth. I spoke to other people who knew him. And I actually visited Dartmouth College, who have Ruzika's archive, and most pertinently have the original drawings, or really paintings, of these alphabets that Ruzika created, um, which were then reproduced, mass reproduced in the book. So this is the closest way I could get to having a, um, getting his direct input on the design process. Previously, my only reference for the shapes of these designs was the uh, offset, I think offset printed book, uh, which has a lot of ambiguity in it, many imperfections and inconsistencies, so it's a little difficult to interpret his intentions. But looking at these original paintings, I could see all of these details, I'm going to enhance that a little bit. So hopefully you can see, I could see every little brush stroke. I can see the white paint where he covered up parts of the letters to revise his decisions. Uh, it gave me a much better, much better sense of what he intended and explained some of the little hiccups and bumps in the letter forms. I still had to make a lot of different, uh, a lot of changes and reinterpretations of things as I put them into digital for, form. Um, working with crisp vector outlines is a very different thing than painting a letter form with a brush. Uh, so in the process, I really was trying to get into his head, essentially having a sort of posthumous collaboration with him. Um, throughout the process, I was asking, what would Ruzika have done if he had worked on this today? If he had known the applications that it would be needed for Dartmouth College, if he'd known the most recent technologies and how digital type has changed the limitations of what we can do with a font. So here you can see sort of a before and after of um, an auto trace version of his original source and my digitization of it. My first step was to go through all this reference material and match it as best I could, making decisions about how to handle the shapes along the way. Uh, he had drawn these letters at a large size, a relatively like two inches tall. Um, he never really had the opportunity to test them by doing things like setting them in paragraphs of text. Uh, he certainly didn't anticipate something like web fonts. So I had the capability to test all these things and see how everything looked in context. Uh, one thing I noticed pretty quickly was that the weight of the typefaces he had established it in his paintings was a little too light when I looked at it in paragraphs of text, both in print and on screen. So going from my tracing of his original artwork, I made it a good bit heavier for the regular weight of the typeface, the sort of default weight that you would use for text. Uh, for me, it was a little difficult to go in and mess with uh, work that had been done by basically one of my heroes of design but I tried to do that as sensitively as I could and kept in mind that Ruzika probably would have done the same thing if he had had the opportunity to look at them the way that I was looking at them. And in addition to, um, to all that, thinking about the way he would have done things, I really was trying to focus on what was the intended use, what's the end product that we're creating. Uh, OCD also asked me to push to this extreme weight of an extra bold, which is something that I probably never would have done, definitely not something that Ruzika ever did, drawing things with such a heavy weight. Uh, but they particularly wanted something for use with the Dartmouth sports team, which are a big deal on campus. Um, and that actually really helped me with attacking a problem that had been difficult with, for me when I started the project years before, uh, which was creating a bold weight that really felt accurate to the spirit of what Ruzika would have done. And I found that 
pushing things a little past where they need to be and then pulling back makes decision making quite a bit easier. So uh, going from this extra bold back to the bold made, made those decision e decisions easier. And as you can see in this older version, that's what I had drawn before, but I actually, like this is a much better solution than what I had sketched previously. Um, so those kinds of requests from a client can really help you figure out the decisions and, and um, make better decisions in the process. So this is, this is the full range of styles that we created, what we call Dartmouth Ruzika. Uh, OCD really wanted a broad palette of weights with Roman and Italic to have many voices for the design system. Looking at the Italic particularly, uh, there were some special problems in the Italic. He had drawn this very calligraphic thing which was basically rooted in what a broad edged pen would do, what you would write in calligraphy. Uh, those calligraphic swashes felt a bit too precious for everyday use and for, for use in paragraphs of text. But as a first step, I tried replicating them digitally and doing a direct reference to that. Ultimately, we decided doing something much more restrained, as you can see circled in green here. But we kept some of those characteristics, which are still circled in blue on the last line. Uh, so there is some calligraphic underpinning to this, but it feels much more toned down and sedate. We did keep the full set of swashes on that second line as an alternate so that it adds an extra level of versatility to the type family for use in uh, more formal applications like an invitation or the graduation program. Uh, of course, I only had this basic alphabet to work from in the original source material. It was just that one page. So I looked at other work by Ruzika and by his contemporaries for addressing the missing characters, the punctuation, the currency symbols, the extended alphabet and the diacritics, um, making all of these extended alphabet characters work in a functional typeface requires adaptation and reworking from the various sources that I was looking at, trying to make it into a cohesive whole. And that just takes a lot of trial and error and um, experimenting with different combinations of things until I hit on the right combinations. If I've done my job well, hopefully all of these moving parts have come together as a cohesive system into the dartmouth Ruzika type family. Um, so that's the type family that we created, which was a huge amount of work for me. I had spent a lot of time on it previously, and then we worked on it with, uh, with Dartmouth for about two or three months, which was actually a very accelerated timeline for something this complex. Um, but there was a much bigger thing in terms of importance to Dartmouth, which was their logo type. Um, for me, a much smaller part of the project, but for them, probably the most important. Uh, there was another plate in the studies in type design that we chose as the basis for the logo type, which Ruzika had also used uh, the sim a similar style for the Dartmouth Bicentennial Medal in 1969, around the same time that the book was published. Here's his original drawing for that, uh, that medal. So we took that basic structure and the style that Ruzika developed and used that as the basis for the logo type, which you can see here. Uh, we ended up adjusting a lot of details in it to make it a little less fussy, taking away some of the sort of brush stroke qualities of it and making it more crisp and contemporary. OCD also created this, uh, what they called the D Pine, which is a more simplified logo, incorporating the capital D from the logo type that I created and a redrawn version of the Lone Pine Tree, which is drawn from older uh, branding elements that Dartmouth had used. It was very important for them to have an asset that they could use for social media especially. So this is what they use on Twitter and on business cards and other things. Uh, so all of these elements come together in a dynamic system that OCD created. The typeface, the logotype, the D-Pine, and a system of patterns and other uh, ornaments and um, uh, diagrammatic systems. Hopefully Ruzika's aesthetic voice and the fact that I worked on a lot of these elements as well draws them all together and gives them a cohesive voice. Here's how that plays out on the business cards where they're using all of these elements together. And then in a printed booklet that they designed. Uh, also for the typographic lockups for different departments in the school. OCD also prepared a detailed guideline document for the identity system showing how the fonts uh, had different special features, uh, the lining figures and tabular figures, uh, ligatures and swashes as well. They also paired the typeface, my Dartmouth Ruzika, with the typeface National Number no. 2, designed by Chris Sowersby. It's a sans serif that was already existing. 
uh, but it provides a nice contrast to the typeface, extending the range of the design system much more broadly, so they can use these two for different situations and use them together as well. So just to sum up kind of the, the themes that I'm trying to emphasize about creating historical authenticity. Um, history can be a great shortcut to authenticity, authenticity and design, I think. Uh, it's a great place to start when you're trying to create something that feels tied to the history of a brand or of an institution. Uh, collaborating with the past is a way that I like to think about this kind of thing. Even someone who's no, no longer living can essentially be a mentor to you if you really try to get into, into their head and think about the decisions they would make. Uh, working with a historical source, the, the way that I like to approach that is to start with precise fidelity to the source and then step from there into adapting and rethinking the decisions that were made in the original. I think often people will kind of go the other way around and create something and then try to add a layer of historical vibe to it or something. Um, and finally, using specific use cases and the end, end use of the project to guide your decisions is really like the guiding light for me. I guess that's a no-brainer when you're working, something, working with something like interface design, but with something like a typeface, it's easy to get carried away with the, the aesthetics and stop thinking about the end use. So that's always something I have to remind myself. Um, Dartmouth and I had an arrangement of limited exclusivity for this Dartmouth Ruzika typeface, which means that ultimately I'm allowed to sell the fonts publicly as well. So I've renamed them for public sale and with some changes as study. So this is the new typeface study that we're selling through XYZ Type. Uh, we just created a new type specimen to show this off, which was designed by uh, two designers, Chantal uh, Joshin and Noah Baker. They did some really interesting things with the, the typeface that I wouldn't have expected. Both of these posters, which are, they're essentially fake gig posters for uh, different bands. They uh, used study in ways that I never would have expected, certainly ways that Rudolf Rizika would not have foreseen at all. So that was really cool to me to see. Um, that's one of the joys of typeface design, I think, is seeing your work used in unexpected ways and seeing it grow to have a life of its own beyond what you expect. So I actually brought a bunch of these specimens here today. So um, if you'd like, I'll uh, have those up on the table with the food up here if you want to grab one afterward. Also have some fun little stickers with an alphabet. With XYZ. So that's my little um, publicity push. But uh, take a look at it and see our other typefaces. Thank you. <laughs> And I Jesse, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we have a couple minutes for Q&A, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll run over and come grab you. Um, but just to kick things off, what is one typeface you are tired of seeing? <laughs> oh, man. Um, Gotham is an easy answer. Gotham <laughs> is very overused and uh, something that people fall back on as a, a crutch because it uh, usually looks good. So. Awesome. Uh, and then the second real question for you is, uh, how did you become a typeface designer in the first place? Uh, well, I, I really have been fascinated by letter forms and by type since a young age. So starting in really, I guess, around like high school age, I think I, I was of the era before like fast internet and I was dialing into bulletin boards and they had all these pirated fonts. I was downloading as many fonts as I could and uh, got excited about understanding them. So. That kind of led me into design school, studying at Rhode Island School of Design, where I focused my studies around typeface design. Cool. Uh, we'll open it up. Don't be shy. Yeah, please. Besides that typeface, what is your favorite typeface besides that one? That's a hard one. Um, I, I like to steal a, a question that one of my colleagues, an answer that one of my colleagues gives, which is like, the one I'm working on right now, because you know. I, the funny thing is I don't really use fonts that much. I just, you know, I don't, I don't do graphic design. I just uh, make my own. So I try to just use my own. I don't have a great answer for you. <laughs> I, if I had to give one, I'd say Fairfield by Rudolf Rizika, which is uh, one of his lesser, lesser used these days typefaces, but beautiful typeface. Never had a great digital version. So if you can get someone to typesetting, typeset something on a linotype machine where they type it out by hand, and it's cast in metal. That's what I recommend. <laughs> Not the most efficient if you're trying to print from Word. 
Yeah, over here. Uh, yeah, sure. Hey, Jesse. So um, I'm over here, sorry. Um, thanks for showing us your process about like how to revive a typeface that hasn't been made into a typeface yet. I liked how you talked about using other work from the designer. It was really cool. Um, how would this, whenever I look at Rizika, I see so many like uh, relations to like Palatino, and I don't see too many like um, typefaces in that vein. Can you talk more about um, that style? And it's very distinctive, so I'm almost surprised that like a client would sign on to a style like that because it's distinctive, but it's really beautiful and kind of rare. Yeah, I, I would say that getting them to sign on to it was largely the strength of OCD agency that they were able to sell it to them. You know. I think that they really um, gave them a, a hard sell on it and gave them a good pitch and showed them how it could be used well. But um, yeah, I think that what those two have in common, and I did look at Palatino a bit while I was working on this, um, they both have, they, as I was saying before, kind of walk the tightrope between calligraphic and typographic. It's certainly not something that you could draw with a pen, but you see the evidence of that in a lot of ways. Um, there's a lot of tension between form and counterform, which is what I'm drawn to in it. But um, yeah, I think it's something that it's becoming, it's become more popular in recent years, a sort of resurgence of that aesthetic and those qualities, which I think is great. So, yeah. Others? Yeah, I saw him here. Um, I enjoyed seeing your, your process and um, starting from the research to the finished product. Um, how long did it take? I'm just curious. It's, 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 it's there's a lot that you did. It's to quantify that because, you know, like I said, the, from like getting the all, all clear from Dartmouth to start to delivering it was like two and a half months. But I, I mean, I first saw this book 20 years ago <laughs> and started doing a digital version of it almost 10 years ago. So it was something I worked on in my spare time over the years. But so it really, I mean, something this complex, I could easily spend three months working full time on it. Um, the last couple of weeks before I delivered it, it was uh, it was pretty rough there. Yeah, not a lot of sleep. All right, Jesse. Uh, I think that's all the time we have okay. for questions, unfortunately. But thank you so much for yeah. kicking things off tonight. That was fantastic. Thank you all.